So my name is Leo Williams. This is my oldest son, William. I'm William, I'm Bertie. Um, I live with my mom. Um, like my family, my friends. And that's about it. And we have been going to Quad City Christian Church. This will be our 10th year. So to give you a little bit about our backstory, I went through some pretty terrible uh, thyroid issues with Graves' disease, suffered for it with several years until they could actually remove my thyroid, and was just kind of going through the process of healing uh, when I went through a terrible divorce. And so at that point, I heard about um, a life group, and so I thought, you know, I need some people in my life. And there was another couple there that shared their story that they were going through the process of becoming foster parents. And so I went over after the life group was over and asked her more about it because years ago when my two boys were little, I really felt like God had called me to be a foster parent, but it just never worked out. So I started talking to this woman and telling her that I felt like God had called me years ago to be a foster parent. And it just all of a sudden started like, blossoming in my spirit. You have been called. What are you going to do about it? Okay, well, I'm in my 50s. I just got divorced. I don't have any money. You know, you're calling me at this time to step up to the plate. And he's like, yes, I am. And I ended up taking a total of eight children into my home, but I ended up adopting a sibling group of four. December 30th, 2019, I was 60 years old, and I was the uh, proud mother of all these little kids. <laughs> so my children's ages go five, seven, eight, 10, 37, and 40. There's one thing that I learned in life. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. I couldn't have done it without the church, the generosity of the church, their time, um, making us meals, driving to Holbrook with me in a car filled with kids, and giving up their time while I was in court hearings. It, I can't even tell you all the generous ways that people stepped up for me, being a single mom. These four little kids wouldn't have a mom if it hadn't been for the generosity of the people of this church to step up and help me through this time of my life. And so, you know, to think about how that is going to affect future generations because of the generosity inside the church walls. And so I'm very excited about Excel because I wanna see what it can do in other people's lives and who I'm gonna to get to step up and help in their calling. I hope if you walk away with nothing else today, that you walk away remembering that story and recognizing the fact that the church, the local body of believers is the greatest investment that we could ever give our lives to. Like it is the only thing that is gonna make it into eternity. And this is the, the type of impact that a local church can have on people's lives. And those little kids' lives will be changed forever. In fact, there's a brand new chapter to the story uh, this morning at our 8 a.m. service, those children were baptized today into Jesus. <clears throat> we shot that video several weeks ago, and they've been having these conversations, and they said, uh, today's the day. And so it was an amazing moment. This is why we get to do what we do. And I hope that you walk out recognizing what an amazing investment the body of Christ is. I want to welcome all of you in today. Uh, my name's Jason. I am one of the pastors here. I want to welcome all of those in Prescott Valley today. So grateful to have you with us this morning. Uh, and by the way, it is Pastor Ken's birthday out there in PV today. So make sure you say happy birthday to him. And he is older than I am. So you can just rub that in. Although I don't know if that's much of a flex because he doesn't look it. So there's that. Hey, if you were with us uh, last week, we kicked off a brand new series that we're calling Excel. And this is an amazing opportunity for us as a church. It's an amazing season. It goes well beyond just a sermon series. Um, 
Hopefully you walked out of here last week understanding the, the whole vision behind this Excel season. It is a two-year discipleship journey where each of us are committing to take a step to grow as a better disciple of Jesus, knowing that as we do, it will actually fuel us to make, the, to make more disciples of Jesus, which is our mission. So here's what I want you to hear, church. Um, what we do over this next few years, which will, in, I'm sorry, next few weeks, uh, that'll impact where we go for the next couple of years, it has the potential to change our church for the next few decades. Like we have this opportunity in front of us literally to take ground for the kingdom of God. Like that's what we're trying to accomplish and create an outpost of disciple-making ministry that can be leveraged for kingdom advancement for generations to come. So if you missed out on the vision of what Excel is all about, I highly encourage you to go back and, and watch it. It's on our website. The easiest way is just find it on your app. If you just pull your app up, it'll be the first thing on your dashboard. You can find that vision video there so that you can understand what we're trying to accomplish. I, but I don't want you just to understand what we're doing. I want you to understand how amazing this opportunity is to get excited about the potential that is in front of us. Not to impact just hundreds of people, not even thousands, but the potential to impact thousands, tens of thousands of people through what we're accomplishing through Excel. And that's not an exaggeration. Like I hope if you've been around here for very long, you have recognized I'm not much of a hype man. Like I don't, I just, that's just not the way I'm wired. Like those who know me best know that I am much more of an Eeyore than a Tigger, okay? <laughs> like I am a natural born pessimist. I am a gifted killjoy. <laughs> I am a certified professional skeptic. Like if you ever need somebody to come into your life and to shoot down your dreams, I'm your guy. It's what I do best. And with that being true, here's what I believe. The kingdom impact that stands before us is greater and grander than I think most of us even realize. The ripple effect of what we're embarking on has the potential to change eternities for generations to come. But it isn't going to just happen. It's not just going to magically come into fruition. We have to seize it. We have to step into it. We have to be willing to do the hard thing and pounce on the moment with gusto that God has set before us. And it starts, as every great move of God always starts, it starts with God first doing something in us before he does something through us, which is what this six-week series is all about. We're asking God to take this time to do something in us, to start transforming us, and then, and then it'll set us up for God to do something through us. Now, I want to invite all of you to our advanced commitment night. So for those of you who are willing to lead out in generosity, to go first in this season, we would love for you to come join us at advanced commitment night. It's happening in a few weeks, September 14th. We're going to be doing it out at Finley Toyota Center out in Prescott Valley. We would... Be honored for as many of you that are able to come to come. Like we don't have the opportunity as a church to all gather together in one space and celebrate what God's doing together. This is an opportunity for us to do that. So all of you in PV, all of you in Prescott, we want to get all of us in the room at the same time and allow God to do something great in us and celebrate what he's going to do through us. So, everybody write that down. Hopefully, you will come and enjoy us for that. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them on or turn them to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Or if you have your booklet, how many of y'all got your booklet? Yes. All right, pull those out. It's on page 28. If you don't have a booklet, just raise your hand. All of our ushers are in the back. They would love to bring you one. So, with this series, we do have a booklet that goes with it. 
And in it, there's room to take sermon notes. There's some personal reflection questions as well. So grab one of those. All of the vision about what Excel is all about is also in there. So you can read that when you get home. When you get home, not during the sermon. So grab you one of those. Again, you can join us on page 28 in your booklet. Now, as you're diving in, uh, as we dive into this text today, let me remind you of where we left off last week. We are looking at these two chapters in, in this book of 2 Corinthians. And in this, uh, Paul is writing to a church in the city of Corinth, and he's inviting in, them into this opportunity to use their resources to help people that they may never meet, to actually leverage their resources for the sake of other people. And in doing so, in these two chapters, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, in these two chapters, he's going to give them what I think is the greatest theological footing for generosity that we have in the entire Bible. And here's, here's where we left off last week. But since you excel in everything, and this is where we get the title for the series, since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge, in complete earnestness and in the love that we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. So Paul begins inviting them into this uh, opportunity for generosity, and he starts by placing generosity and giving into a category most of us have never put it in. He puts it into this category of things that we as believers recognize that we always have to keep growing in. He puts it into a category of things that we as followers of Jesus know we never, we never are able to check off the list. Things like faith, like you will never get to the place in your life on earth where you say, I can check the box of faith. I have no more room to grow in faith. I've hit the pinnacle of my faith. No, no, no. You never do that. Or knowledge. None of us are ever going to get to the place where we say, I know enough about following Jesus. All there is to know, I know it. Nothing more for me to learn. Never going to be there. Or love. Like, like. None of us are ever going to get to the place where we say, oh, I, I totally 100% love God and love people all the time. Got it down, checked the box, nothing to do for me in this category. No, we recognize in all of these things there's, there's room to excel. Excel simply means to take a step, to go beyond, to outdo, to surpass. And he says, just as you excel in all of those things, Jesus follower, See that you also excel in this grace of giving. Put generosity, put giving in that same category of things that you're going to excel in, to outdo, to pursue, to keep growing in, to something you recognize we never, we never get to check this box. No matter how generous you are, there's a step to be taken for all of us to continue to grow. Here's our takeaway from last week. When it comes to generosity, we never arrive. We never arrive. There isn't an amount, there isn't a percentage that we get to say we have arrived and can check off the list. This is something we are going to, for the rest of our lives, we're called to excel in. So this is where Paul starts this conversation. That we have to begin by placing giving in a new category, you and I haven't arrived. There is a next step for us. And with that understanding, let's dive into our text today, which is literally the next verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. I'm not commanding you. Isn't that good news? And you like that? Everybody likes that one, right? This is good news. I know for some of you, like when you think about giving or generosity, especially in the context of the church, specifically giving to the work of God, you've been told and maybe you've been even berated with the idea that it is a command. And you've been bludgeoned with this idea that until you get this right, there's no way you can be right with God. Now, 
I don't have time to work through all of the verses that address this issue about giving throughout the scriptures. And there's a lot of them. Jesus talks about it a lot. But Paul wants us to know, specifically in the context of this initiative that he's trying to bring about, Paul recognizes, he says, I'm not, I'm not commanding you. He says, I'm inviting you into something. I'm not commanding you into something. I'm inviting you. For this project specifically, I'm inviting you in. In fact, as we're going to see throughout these two chapters, he's going to say, look, if your giving into this thing that I'm trying to do comes from a place of compulsion, if you feel berated or manipulated, then you shouldn't give because that kind of giving does not honor God. And our generosity ought to be God-honoring. And so if it's not honoring God, then just don't do it. That's what he's going to say. Because as we said last week, all throughout this text, what we're going to see over and over again is Paul is way more concerned about the heart of where the money is coming from than the need of where the money's going to. He's way more concerned about the heart of those who are giving, giving rather than the need of those who are getting. He is addressing the heart. And a command to give, a mandated act of generosity, does not reflect a God-honoring heart. It just doesn't. Mandated giving is a counterfeit generosity. Like You, ca you cannot mandate generosity. Generosity, by its very nef definition, is voluntarily going above and beyond. That's what it means to be generous. You can't command that. As we're going to see as Paul works through the rest of this chapter, we'll come back to that in a few weeks. Paul writes, I'm not commanding you, but, here's the but, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. So again, we've got to back up just a little bit because he began this whole section talking to the Corinthian church about these other churches. One's called the Macedonian churches, like Thessalonica and, and Philippi and Berea. And he, he talked about these churches, and they were undergoing severe trial. They were undergoing extreme persecution and poverty. And they hear about this initiative that Paul's doing, and they are so excited. Like, they are so eager. They beg Paul, please let us be a part of this. They are so eager. They take up an offering, and Paul's like, I don't know. Wow, he went above and beyond anything he could have expected. Like, they were so engaged and desiring and eager to be generous. So Paul says to the Corinthians, I'm not commanding you. You don't have to do this, but I am going to compare it. I'm going to compare your giving, your generosity, because it reflects the sincerity of your love. Like I saw that in the, in the Macedonian churches, and I... I will see it in you too. How you respond to this opportunity does reflect your love. It is a picture of your heart. That's what he says. How you give reflects your heart. Now, hear me out. Money is almost never our idols. You know, Scripture talks a lot about having idols in our hearts. And here's what I want you to know. Good news for you today. Money is almost never our idols. Like ever. Like I, I, I had a hard time this week. I can't say never, but almost never. I couldn't come up with any that I think that are where money is the idol. However, money is used to worship our idols. Which means that money becomes one of the greatest revealers of our idols. Money shows us what our idols are. Let me, let, me, let me show it to you this way. Money reveals what is most important to us. What we've put on top of the list. If your image is what is most important, it gets revealed in the clothes that we wear, the car that we buy, the neighborhood that we live in, and how much Botox we use. Like, it becomes 
The use of our money reveals that our image is so important to us. It, it, it reveals our idol. It's not our idol. If security is what is most important to us, it gets revealed in how much money we hoard. I mean save. I save. I said save. <laughs> how much we save. Because there's something in us that says this money will make me secure. It will keep me safe. But it just reveals that really our idol is Security. If entertainment is what is most important to us, it gets revealed on how much we spend on concerts and vacations and, and, and sports venue tickets and that trailer full of toys that are sitting in the back of your yard. Like it doesn't, it's not the money that's the idol, but the money wor- reveals our worship and it gets spent on all of these things. If kids are what are most important, it gets revealed on how much we invest in their sports endeavors or their wardrobe or their array of gadgets. And if God is what is most important to us, it will get revealed by how much we are willing to invest in the kingdom of God, into the in- into the events and the environments and the people that grow our faith and grow our kids' faith and helps others to connect to the grace of God. Our money is rarely ever our idol, but our money will always reveal our idol. It is the avenue of our worship, which is why Jesus famously said, it is a reflection of your heart. It shows you what you love. Jesus put it this way, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Wherever your treasure is, it reveals where your heart is. Don't get them backwards. It doesn't go the other way. You can convince yourself, well, my heart is over here with Jesus. No, no, it's not. Not unless your treasure is. Because your treasure always follows, I'm sorry, your heart always follows your treasure. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. Your heart follows your treasure, not the other way around. Your money will reveal what is most important to you. And again, Paul, throughout this whole verse Uh, This whole section is concerned about the heart of these people. So he says, I'm not commanding you, but I am comparing you to see where your love is. Because how you respond to this opportunity to be generous, it reveals your heart. So Paul is saying, I saw it in the Macedonians. I saw it through their generosity. And I hope to see it in yours. And this isn't the only comparison Paul's going to make. To motivate generosity in these people. Paul moves from pointing to the Macedonians to pointing to Jesus himself as the greatest picture of generosity. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor. Jesus was rich, and then he became poor what Paul says. Now, for us to understand what Paul's saying here, we have to begin with the reality that Jesus' story did not begin in a manger surrounded by sheep, shepherds, and drummer boys. Okay? It's not where his story begins. Long before Jesus was a baby in Bethlehem, he was God on the throne in heaven. Like, we believe that our God is three in one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who have eternally existed as a part of the Godhead, which means that Jesus was rich because he was God. He was in heaven. Everything was his. Like, it all belonged to him. Like, he was rich. He had it all. He was God. He is God. And he was rightly worshipped every moment in the holy of holies, in the throne room of heaven. The angels sang his praises. Everyone in his presence rightly bowed down in worship to him. All glory was his. That was Jesus' life from eternity past. He was rich. It was all his. He had everything. 
But when God created the heavens and the earth, he created man in his image and breathed his spirit to bring that man to life. When those who were made in his image rebelled against their creator, Jesus, of his own will and volition, under no compulsion or obligation, Jesus decided to give up everything that made him rich. Jesus exchanged heaven for earth. He exchanged a throne room for a cave. He exchanged praise all the time to vast criticism. He exchanged glory for shame. He exchanged power for weakness. He exchanged being worshipped for being whipped. He exchanged proclaiming his will to pleading for his will. He exchanged having his name be hallowed to having his name be cursed. He exchanged having the earth as a footstool for having no place to lay his head. He exchanged being all-knowing to having to be taught. He exchanged being served to serving the least of these. He exchanged being bowed to to bowing down at the feet of his disciples. He exchanged eternal pleasures at God's right hand for the greatest pain known to man. He exchanged divinity and wrapped it into flesh. He The creator became part of the creation. The king of kings took off his throne and picked up a cross. And the author of life gave himself over to death. I don't think there's any way for us to truly comprehend the value of what Jesus gave up. Of how he went from vast wealth that we could never understand. In Paul's words, he was rich. He had it all. And he exchanged it. And for your sake, he became poor. To try to imagine this gap, to imagine this gap, I don't think we can fully comprehend how great a leap Jesus took in that moment from being God on the throne in heaven to becoming a man. A peasant carpenter. I don't think we can understand. To imagine the gap between the king of England or Elon Musk, whatever the highest you can think of as human's rank, whatever you think that is, to imagine that gap to the most destitute, broken, powerless, forgotten, crippled child living in the slums of India. A nameless, faceless life who lives in a trash heap on the backside of the world whose entire life will come and go and no one will know it ever existed. That gap between those two can't even begin to compare to the gap between being the holiest of holy to literally becoming our sin and dying on a cross. Jesus knew what it was to be rich. And he voluntarily gave up being rich and made himself poor. Why? So that you, through his poverty, might become rich. He gave up the vast richness that he had and made himself poor so that through his poverty, you could be rich. He gave up all that was rightfully his so that you could have what you never should have been given. He gave up what was rightfully his so that you could have what was never yours. He became poor 
so that you could be rich. He descended so that you could be exalted. He took on flesh so that you could experience the divine. He became a servant so that you could reign. He was tempted so that you could overcome. He was despised so that you could be glorified. He was shamed so that your shame could be removed. He was condemned so that you could be freed. He was convicted so that you could be forgiven. He became homeless so that you could have an eternal home in glory. He was separated from the Father so that you could be brought back to the Father. He was cursed so that you could be sanctified. He was reviled so that you could be redeemed. He was put to death so that you could experience life. Jesus gave up all that was rightfully his so that you, can, uh, you and I could experience what we never rightfully deserve. And he did it voluntarily. Here's how Jesus said it in John 10. He says, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life. I do it. Nobody else lays down my life, I do it. I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. Nobody's forcing me, nobody could force me, but I lay it down of my own accord. It is my choice. I'm voluntarily laying down my life. I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. He says, Everything that I give up, it's my decision. I'm doing it of my own accord. He did it so that you and I could become rich. To get what we do not deserve. Which is why Jesus is the greatest example of generosity that we could ever have. So it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus says to the followers of Jesus... Just follow the example of the one who came before you. You claim to be his followers, then follow him. This is what he did. There is nothing that we could give up that could compare to what Jesus gave up. But when we willingly give up what may be rightfully ours for the sake of others... It's actually just one small way we honor the generosity of the one who gave up everything for us. Not out of a command. Jesus wasn't commanded. He did it voluntarily. And Paul's inviting us to do the same. Here's what I want you to hear today. We should be eager to excel in the grace of giving because of the eager generosity of our Savior. Like, we should be eager. Like, of all people in all of time that have ever existed, followers of Jesus should never have to have anybody twist their arms to be generous. Like, ever. Like, because we have a Savior who gave up everything, who was rich, who had it all, and said, I'll give it up. I will become poor so that they can be rich. Like eager generosity should be the standard for people who follow Jesus. What Jesus gave is what made it possible for us to be saved. What Jesus gave is what made it possible for us to be saved. And I want you to know that our generosity, our choosing voluntarily and eagerly Our generosity in excelling in the grace of giving can be, should be, will be the catalyst for other people being saved. When we invest in the local church, invest into the kingdom of God, what we give is a catalyst that allows other people to be saved. Again, you just need to understand, God always uses people who know him to resource the work for those who don't know him. Like this is the way God set it up. God always uses people who know him to resource the work for those who don't know him. 
It does every church you've ever attended operated this way, every missionary you've ever heard of operated this way, every every Christian school or hospital, like every every time somebody goes out in the name of Jesus to make him known, they are being resourced by people who already know him. It has been that way from the beginning. Even in Paul's ministry, he'll talk about the Philippians when he says, I came to Macedonia and nobody else helped me, but you did. You sent me resources time and again so that the ministry that I'm operating under can continue to flourish. The Philippians, you did that because God always uses people who know him to resource the work for people who don't know him. It's been that way from the beginning. This is the way it's always been. The kingdom takes ground through the work, witness, and resources of his people. Our generosity is what fuels the work of the kingdom in the Quad City area and around the world. Paul made this argument back in Romans chapter 10. If you were in our Romans series, you may remember this. Paul reminds us, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And to that we say, yes and amen. It is open and available. The gospel is for everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. Notice that's in quotation marks. Paul's quoting a text from the Old Testament. But he throws this truth out, and then he asks several questions. This is true. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Yes and amen. However, Paul says, how can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without somebody preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? We love this top part. Yes and amen to everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But Paul's pressing into the people of God and saying, But how can they call if they haven't believed? And how can they believe if they haven't heard? And how can they hear unless somebody preaches? And how can they preach unless somebody sends them? Like we all want this, but to get this, we got to do these. And I want you guys to understand that through this Excel initiative, we are trying to equip those that we have sent out into PV. Like we've sent them. We stayed here a year and a half ago, and I said, raise your hands. you got to go. And they did, and they're there. We're so grateful. And now we got to equip them. we got to give them everything that they need to reach everyone that they can in a community that is being flooded with people who need to hear the gospel so that they can believe, so that they can call on him and be saved. And I just think we ought to be able to do that eagerly. We ought to be eager. We ought to be eager to make ourselves more materially poor so that others can become spiritually rich. We ought to be eager to make ourselves materially more poor so that others can become spiritually rich. Because we follow a rabbi who gave up everything to make us rich. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for this challenge today from your word. For the amazing example that Jesus shows us. of What it looks like to give up everything for the sake of others. And I pray that as we follow him, that we will follow him in this area too. And that we would eagerly excel for the sake of others. We would be willing to become poor so that they can be rich because that's what Jesus did for us. Spark generosity in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.